Guys, I've got to, of course, go into, um, of course, ancient Greece today. And um, most, like I said, I'm going to talk about the uh, Greek Bronze Age. That's the main thing we'll get to today uh, and talk about. Uh, and I'll talk about the uh, Minoans and the Mycenaeans. Those are the main ones, of course, that were part of the early Greek Bronze Age, which is also called, by the way, the so-called Aegean Civilization as well. Uh, so I'll get into that. I'll talk about the Trojan War, which kind of happens about the same time uh, also as well. And then uh, I'll also get into and talk about the rise of the, the Greek city-states, which comes in uh, kind of around the 8th century BC. So um, talk a little bit about the background of Greece a little bit. Uh, like you're talking about in the video, yeah, you know, Greece kind of starts about three to four thousand years ago. It's about right uh, what it is uh, mainly, and um, it is considered one of the first European civilizations that first develops because you know you had the first four river valley civilizations that we talked about, which were um, Mesopotamia, India, uh, China, China, and Greece, uh, in. So it's the fifth one kind of that comes along next. Uh, then you got the Roman one, of course, later. Greece is considered to be the birthplace of, um, of Western culture or Western civilization. So that's where we get a lot of our information about, like, you know, history. History kind of starts there, Greek philosophy, uh, the Greek religion, uh, architecture, the Greek drama plays, like the tragedy uh, type play. Uh, and so on. Philosophy and all that kind of come later, uh, more or less. And I have maps uh, kind of to show you, at least one main map I've got for now, I'll show you. But the Greek world itself, like they said in the video, uh, mostly occurs around the Aegean Sea, uh, which you can see in the middle. It's kind of situated between the Black Sea uh, and the Mediterranean Sea. And most of the Greeks pretty much lived in and around that basin uh, from like, you know, where Thrace, Thrace or Thrace as you can see there at the top, all the way down to Crete. That's basically about uh, where uh, they were kind of in and around, kind of between Turkey and Greek, the Greek mainland, like it says in that little slide banner right there. And uh, they also didn't just live, you know, on the mainland. They lived like throughout a lot of the um, islands. Uh, in all the different peninsulas that were part of part of uh, Greece. Uh, this whole area you're looking at in the map that's coming down is right here. It's all part of the Balkans Peninsula, they call it, which goes up here from Greece, Macedon, I think uh, Bul Bulgaria, Romania, all those um, ex-Yugoslavian you know, states like Bosnia, et cetera, like, uh, Serbia, are all kind of up in here. Uh, as well. So all that's all part of the so-called Balkans Peninsula uh, that's there. So there's different parts of Greece. Uh, and I think it was um, Plato that said once that the Greeks lived around the Aegean like frogs around a pond. Uh, so, but they weren't just around, around the Aegean Sea. They were around the Black Sea, around Italy, you know, and other areas in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, pretty much. Crete, you know, down here, uh, and so on. So the Greek peoples were all over the place, you know, in the region. Uh, oh, by the way, the name Europe, since we're talking about it, uh, comes from this Greek mythological stories that the Greeks used to tell a long, long time ago. Uh, it's, it's about, of course, this woman named Europa. That's, that's who Europe is named after. It's actually named after a woman. Europa was this uh, Phoenician princess that was supposedly kidnapped by Zeus. Um, and um, he eventually took her uh, to what is the island of Crete, uh, which you saw just on the bottom of the uh, Aegean in the upper part of the Mediterranean Sea, you can see on the map. And anyway, uh, she went on to be like the queen of Crete, basically. And she had actually one of her sons, her main son anyway, uh, was, was King Minos. And King Minos would go on to be like considered to be like the first, I guess, major king of Europe that they actually have. So it's kind of where they get the term, term Minoans from, 
It's kind of named after King Minos. Uh, so that's kind of how the, how the name Europe came about or European, you know, that term being used, of course, uh, today overall. Now, let me get into the different historical periods. Now, um, you study about the period of the Minoans and Mycenaeans, which I'm going to talk about first in Greek, early Greek culture. It's often referred to as being called either the Greek Bronze Age or the Aegean civilization. So either one uh, is usually used. So it's either called the Aegean civilization uh, or also the Greek Bronze Age. You also see it's sometimes called the pre-Hellenic Age or pre-Greek Age. They'll, they'll sometimes call it, which is before the Greek city-states uh, came along uh, and all that. Uh, and um, there are, you can see there are two cultures that were part of this period of the Greek Greek Bronze Age. You got the Minoan culture and the Mycenaean culture. Those are the main ones uh, that were there. The Minoans were mostly a culture uh, that lived in the Aegean Sea. Well, hence, it's kind of why they call them, you know, the the you know, Aegean civilization uh, and all that. Uh, and um, they were a culture predominantly living in two main areas of the Aegean. One was on the island of Crete, uh, is the first thing. And then also there's some islands that are called the Cyclades, which we go back up and show you this map here uh, that I had previously. Cyclades is located about right here. These islands that are kind of right above Crete. So pretty much the Minoans were living pretty much in this area here, they think. They think they had some kind of empire that kind of controlled uh, that region quite a lot. And uh, like I said in that little slide I gave you, they were known mostly uh, for their maritime trade. Uh, they traded with the sea, kind of like the Phoenicians did a long time ago. And they were known for their naval power uh, in general. And um, the... Um, the, uh, they, they really considered, the Minoans are really considered to be one of the first major European civilizations, uh, that and the Mycenaean culture that comes right after. And um, you study about the culture of the Minoans, they weren't really found as a culture until about 1900, uh, when this man named Sir Arthur Evans, close to like almost 1900, went to what is the island of Crete. Because uh, he heard about there might be some evidence there of a culture uh, that was the Mycenaean culture. I think it was Heinrich Schliemann, who I'll talk about later, that was a German archaeologist that told him to go there and look for it. And uh, he went to the island, so he finds this culture that's there, uh, that's been buried there for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. He finds some kind of city and palace complex it was mostly in ruins, that was called Canossus, it was dubbed. And um, Evans worked on it for years, uh, up until, like, I want to say close to World War II, uh, and he began reconstructing it, like rebuilding it. It's a big tourist attraction today, of course, the palace city complex of Canossus. Uh, and... Um, Evans found a lot of other stuff there, like he uh, even found like like what is basically the language system uh, that they would also have as well. Uh, and um, first of all, though, uh, Evans um, was the one that came up with the name. Um, he originally would call the Minoan culture its name from King Minos, uh, which, of course, the Greeks talked about in ancient myths. Uh, from a long time ago, who was some kind of Cretan ruler who they think might be real, but not. They think he might be kind of a mytho mythological type, you know, ruler of some type. Uh, and so he named it after them. Uh, he also found this, like I said, a language there, uh, which he called it Linear A. And Linear A was some type of um, pre-Greek language uh, that used about 80 symbols. Uh, and it was written... They wrote, they wrote their language on uh, what are mostly tablet form, kind of like the Sumerians did. And um, the thing that's famous, of course, about um, 
Conosis, is they have found, like, I mean, if you go, of course, go there uh, to the island of Crete, they still have the actual throne room that's still there, that has the throne in it. Uh, whoever king that was uh, that sat on a throne, of course, they call it the throne room of King Minos, which may not sure if it's really his or not, uh, but um, e Evans was able to uh, begin reconstructing it. You can see parts of the palace. They do think it was a multi-leveled type palace complex uh, that was constructed at Canossus and had a famous courtyard that was kind of in the middle um, as well. Here's some other sections of it uh, that have been kind of reconstructed uh, by, by uh, Evans later. Now, of course, the ma famous story that they always talk about, you know, with um, King Minos and all that is, of course, the so-called legend of the Minotaur, which I'm sure everybody's heard about before. And uh, the Minotaur, of course, was this famous um, monster. It was like a part bull, part man uh, that was supposedly put in a labyrinth uh, that was part of King Minos's palace complex, a labyrinth or a maze. Uh, and I'll kind of tell you the basic story about uh, the story of the Minotaur, which they're not really sure if it's a real story or not. Uh, they seem to think that this might be one of these stories that the Greeks kind of made up about the Cretan peoples, wherever they were. But um, supposedly in the story, uh, King Minos had this white bull. He was supposed to sacrifice to the god, um, to the god uh, Poseidon. Uh, and uh, anyway, the um, um, he didn't want to do that. Uh, and so what happened was he uh, kept the bull for himself. And so um, Poseidon got angry about it. And what happened was he basically um, had um, King Minos' wife, believe it or not, um, got her all horny for this white, the white bull. She had sex with it, believe it or not. It's a crazy story. <laughs> it's a true story, at least from that Greek myth anyway. And uh, anyway, the offspring of this son they had was a monster. It was a bull monster, part bull, part man. And they put it in a maze. Uh, and every, um, I think every um, seven years, they would have to sacrifice boys and girls to it uh, to be to be. Um, actually, excuse me, every, every, every nine years, yeah, every nine years, they had seven boys and seven girls that would, would be fed to it to be eaten, basically. And finally, the, uh, the Greek city state of Athens, who was sending all of the um, sacrifices, got sick of this. And so there's a man named Theseus, uh, who basically was the son of the king of uh, Athens, uh, went over, and he eventually killed it. Uh, went into the maze uh, using a ball of string, and he was able to basically go in there and eventually uh, basically kill the kill the Minotaur. So it's likely a made-up story, though. You know, they're not really sure uh, if that really happened or not. You know, it's just one of those stories. But they do know that bulls uh, were something that were a big part of, of Minoan culture. Um, and uh, one thing that's famous about Minoan culture is they're known for having a lot of um, fresco paintings. Uh, fresco paintings are wall paintings where they use lime plaster. They plaster a wall and they paint over it. Well, I'll get to the Minoan pottery in a second, too, as well. They're, of course, known for having a lot of pottery, making lots of pottery, which they use to store olive oil and wine. Yeah, that's true as well. But, uh, yeah, they were known for all these different paintings that would put on the walls of palaces, uh, the walls of, you know, even their own, uh, even homes that uh, they had. And, yeah, the, the bull leaping fresco, which you're looking at in this picture, uh, is considered to be one of the most famous fresco paintings that was discovered at Canossus. That's been kind of restored, uh, you can see. And uh, they believe that bull leaping was part of some kind of um, – acrobatic sport where men or boys would jump over the backs of bulls and then jump off. Uh, and it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like a kind of something like before precursor, if you want to call to 
before like bullfighting came in later. So it kind of seems like the precursor to it or something like that. And uh, so they're the ones that kind of started all that with bulls. So bulls were evidently a big part of their culture, may have been part of their religion uh, as well, uh, the Minoans. So that's something they were very, very famous for. Uh, so then I've got a lot of paintings I can show you of different fresco paintings. Uh, the the uh, Minoans were very peace-like people. So it's very little evidence of warfare or anything like that. You can see they didn't wear a whole lot of clothes, the men and the women. Uh, like the men, are, you can see they're pretty like this fisherman up the top. You see he doesn't have a whole lot of clothes on. You got two boys boxing, not wearing a whole lot of clothes. The women didn't wear a lot of clothes either. Like they actually would expose their tops or whatever, like open blouses or something like that, believe it or not. Really elaborate hairstyles, of course, you can see. The men, yeah, I don't know who that was exactly, uh, that painting or whatever, but um, but that's kind of some famous frescoes, of course, that are, there's a lot of those. Oh, the, oh I forgot about that one. That one's real famous, of course, the Blue Dolphins image. Uh, which is in Canossus uh, as well. Yeah, but no one's had a lot of pottery. They found pottery all over the place, like in the Mediterranean, Aegean, uh, that relates back to the Minoan culture. I think as far away as Egypt, they have pottery that's been found. There's, of course, Linear A, uh, which you're looking at. That's the language that Sir Arthur Evans found um, on Crete, uh, and uh, it's undecipherable. Uh, they have not been able to translate, of course, uh, the actual language. And so it's kind of tough to really get information about the Minoans, except through archaeology uh, and um, pretty much whatever the Greeks talked about a long time ago about them. Now, one more thing, too, about the um, Minoans. The Minoans are famous for disappearing mysteriously. They kind of decline like overnight, kind of like what happened to the um, Maya or the Indus Valley civilization. Both of them kind of got snuffed out overnight. And um, one of the main theories they've come up with, of course, with ha what happened to the Minoans was that it was all caused by some kind of cataclysmic, cataclysmic excuse me, events uh, that were usually associated with natural catastrophes that may have destroyed them overnight. Uh, they do know that if you go to this map here again, they think in the uh, area where the Cyclades is, which is right here, there was a volcanic eruption that occurred over 3,500 years ago, maybe close to 1600 BC, uh, they believe. And what happened was um, this thing called the Thera eruption happened. Thera was what the... Um, I think the Egyptians called the island of Santorini, which is located in the Cyclades. And uh, evidently this island was part of a volcano uh, that was there. In fact, it was part of a Minoan port city that was very important to the Minoan main fleets or naval fleets. And it was it was destroyed. It blew up, uh, this, this volcano. Uh, they think it maybe happened in about 1600 BC, although it's kind of debated when. It's either in the 16th or 17th centuries. And it, yeah, they destroyed Akrotiri, uh, and they also believe it sent uh, tsunamis that crashed into Crete. Uh, there's actually an island on the island of Crete. There's an actual mountain there called Mount Ida. They think that the tsunamis reached halfway up the mountain. So you can imagine that it, the, the water at one point covered like most of the island and destroyed a lot of the culture overall. Uh, and um, anyway, um, the, um, the study about the um, story of, um, of course, what happened to the Minoans, it's often been compared to the story of Plato talking about the story of Atlantis. Plato later uh, in two works wrote about the story or legend of Atlantis, uh, that it was some kind of civilization like a long time ago, like almost a thousand years before the Greeks, and it was destroyed. Uh, it sank overnight in the ocean. Uh, it was never heard from again. And so a lot of historians think that the um, Minoan civilization 
in its demise is somehow connected to the whole Atlantis story. So it's very interesting about that story. Um, but whether that's really true or not, they don't know. Uh, of course, the Greeks thought that the Atlantis was in the Atlantic Ocean somewhere to the west. Uh, but it could be that it was the Minoans. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and move on next. Of course, I'm going to go on and, of course, talk about what happened also. Now, they have the Mycenaeans. The Mycenaeans came in next uh, as a culture. And it's believed that the um, the Mycenaeans um, were the ones that also helped to cause the decline of the Minoans. So whatever was left of the Minoans at that point were wiped out uh, by the uh, Mycenaean culture uh, that came in at that point. Uh, and... Um, they were part of the Greek Bronze Age as well, uh, the Mycenaean culture, except that they developed on the Greek mainland. Um, although they would, you know, conquer and take over the Aegean as well. And predominantly, they were a culture uh, that developed predominantly uh, in the Peloponnese. I'll go back to that map up there for you, if you don't mind, uh, to show you again. But the Mycenaean culture mostly developed uh, in predominantly in the southern part of Greece, like mostly in the Peloponnese, like in that area. And I guess also where at, around Athens. So kind of knows about mostly where they were the most, uh, like in that region right there. And the Minoan culture was very warlike. Uh, they were ruled by these uh, kings uh, that were called a, um, we can put it up right here. They're called an Anax. Uh, usually the W is silence, silent. And an uh, example of an Anax type ruler was um, King Agamemnon, who you may have heard of, who was the king of uh, Mycenae. Uh, he was considered to be one of the most famous mythologically uh, that went back to uh, Greek time, early Greek times, likely around the Trojan War. And um, the Mycenaeans were known for building fortified cities that were constructed on hilltops just like the later Greek city-states are, the polis. And um, the most famous city, of course, that was built was the city of Mycenae, hence why they're often called Mycenaean, because of that, that particular city, uh, which was considered to be one of the most powerful uh, overall. Um, now, Evans, who I talked about before, Sir Arthur Evans, Evans was the one that discovered a little bit about their culture on Crete. He found their actual language. Um, he uncovered it. He was on the island of Crete discovering the Minoan culture. He came up with, of course, the name for the Mycenaean language, which was called Linear B. So Minoan is Linear A, and Mycenaean is called Linear B. That's the names. Uh, both were pre-Greek languages. So they're kind of Greek Bronze Age languages that were used, of course, on uh, ancient Greece, Greece a long time ago. That one they've been able to translate. Uh, I think that one, I believe the Mycenaean one uses up to something like 200 symbols, uh, I believe. It's been, they've actually been able to decipher that one. Uh, uh, the Mycenaean linear, linear B. And uh, they do think that um, My the Mycenaean language was important later because it helped to develop the later uh, ancient Greek language, which was uh, archaic Greek. They think that Greek evolved from combination of Greek Bronze Age languages like Mycenaean Linear B and probably the influence of the Phoenician language, which I've talked about before. Uh, most of the uh, Mycenaean archaeology that they've done over the years uh, has been done mostly starting in the 19th century. And there's, of course, one man that really brought the Mycenaean culture to light a lot was, of course, Heinrich Schliemann, uh, who, of course, is a famous uh, German archaeologist. He was the one that really brought the whole thing to light, um, especially in the 1800s, uh, more or less. Uh, here's some pictures, by the way, if you want to look at later. Of course, there's Linear B uh, that you're looking at. Of course, here, of course, is some ruins of Mycenae in Greece. This is, of course, Mycenae. Uh, that you're looking at right here. There's a map, of course, of the city. 
of what they think it looked like, uh, more or less. So it, it was definitely fortified. So it's fortified, kind of built on a hill. Uh, you can see it's got kind of like the uh, Minoan culture. It was it had kind of like a palace complex as well with other buildings uh, that are around it. There's also graves and tombs that they built. Uh, they were part of it um, also as well. And um, we'll get more into Schliemann later. Schliemann was this retired German merchant. He, in fact, I think he was a millionaire uh, who had come to America at one point in the 1850s. And uh, he had made a fortune off of the California gold rush. Uh, and so uh, over time, uh, he, he retired. He didn't want to be a merchant anymore. He was pretty wealthy. And so he decided to become an amateur archaeologist. And uh, Schliemann was like, um, was, was not educated. Like he didn't go to colleges or anything like that. He didn't go to a university. So he was pretty much like an amateur archaeologist, uh, pretty much learned the trade himself uh, and is considered, by the way, one of the pioneers uh, in archaeology, especially in the 19th century. Schleiman was obsessed with the uh, Greek poet Homer, uh, who may have lived around the probably 9th century BC. Uh, and if you know, Homer's the one that wrote about the Trojan War. And um, uh, Schleiman really believed that uh, the stories of Homer were based on historical things that had happened, uh, realities, I guess, and not just a bunch of myths, which most people believe. Uh, and so Schleiman went in search of these places uh, like Mycenae and, of course, Troy, ancient Troy, which is in Turkey. And uh, so Schleiman was very instrumental. Uh, he pretty much was so obsessed with, with the um, uh, Iliad and, and Homer and all of that uh, that he practically memorized like the he – he actually memorized the Iliad. Uh, he actually could recite the whole thing in Greek which is amazing <laughs> in Greek. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, now a little bit about Homer, by the way, because we'll get more into Homer a little later. Homer, of course, um, is, uh, of course, famous Greek poet, like I told you. They think he lived, I don't know, it's kind of a debate about when he lived. Ninth century seems to be real popular. I know maybe even further back, it's hard to say. It's either the ninth or the 10th century. Well, it's likely usually when it is. But Homer's famous for two epics that are, have, have been kind of a tribute to him. And um, Homer um, is, was believed to originally have been a bard poet. So he sang these songs about the Trojan War period, uh, which the Iliad is about. Uh, and then he also sang, of course, the story about the Odyssey, which is about the adventures of Odysseus, uh, who was the king of Ithaca and his journey home after the Trojan War ended. Uh, so uh, and I'll get into the Trojan War a little later. Uh, they think that um, the, tr the Trojan War um, likely took took place close to about 1200 BC, uh, likely uh, at one point. Um, we'll get into it later. Uh, Schleiman, of course, used, like I said, these works to search for different archaeological sites uh, he, of course, uh, was known for going to Turkey later, the 1870s, uh, and he would do excavations there where he would try to search for the ancient Troy site, uh, which they believe is a site called Hisarlik, uh, which is in northwestern Turkey today. Uh, they think that might be where the Trojan War happened, but I think historians and archaeologists are still kind of conflicted about whether it is or not uh, the site, but it might be. Uh, more or less. Uh, like I was saying, uh, Mycenae, as of course I said, was a very impressive city uh, compared to some of the other ones. Heavily fortified, like I told you, and built on a hilltop. Uh, it is known for having a type of construction to it uh, that's called Cyclopean walls or, or, or Cyclopean architecture, which I had showed you in this picture. It's where they stack up stone or boulders and use that to uh, construct, you know, um, walls and buildings. I think usually not using mortar, which was something kind of different. Um, but a lot of the architectural, you know, um, planning that went into this was something that heavily influenced the later Greeks, 
that would come along. And uh, one thing that's very famous about Mycenae uh, is the famous Lion Gate. Uh, that's part of it. It's probably the most famous architectural feature uh, that's there, of course, at Mycenae uh, is the Lion Gate. I've got that picture there, and then there's the one more or less the better picture here showing you but inside look at it. And uh, the Lion Gate uh, depicts some kind of um, coat of arms that's in the middle. Well, that This part helps to, I guess, help hold up the top of the wall, you can see here. Uh, and um, it's kind of like a keystone. Look at that there. And I'm guessing it was some kind of coat of arms for whoever ruled over the city, uh, whether it was the house of Atreus that may have been related to King Agamemnon and his family. Uh, they're not sure, uh, but it depicts two lionesses uh, that are opposite of each other with a column in the middle. So you can see like a use of an arch here, which you see later with the Greeks and Romans a lot. Um, and so that kind of architecture is something that, you know, you see later as well. So kind of talking about, you know, um, Heinrich Schliemann, uh, a little bit about him, and, of course, some of the excavations that were done, of course, at, at what is um, Mycenae and also later Troy uh, as well. Now, uh, Schliemann uh, was also known for excavations there. Most excavations that took place at uh, Mycenae were mostly in the 1870s, like I think eight, mid, to eight, mid to late 1870s, I believe, believe when it was. And... Um, one of the most famous things that they found at Mycenae was these huge tombs they built there. That's called a Tholos tomb. I've got a picture of one that I can show you, a Tholos tomb. The Tholos tomb uh, was a type of tomb that was, um, it had a beehive shape to it, literally. It was kind of built in that fashion with stone. Uh, and they would build this huge tomb and then they would bury it with dirt to kind of look like a mound. It was look like the Indian mound, like we have in the United States. And um, a lot of these would be used to uh, bury, you know, kings and put treasury in there. The one you're seeing there uh, at Mycenae uh, was later called the Treasury of Atreus. Uh, and um, it... Um, it's believed to be like maybe where um, Agamemnon's father may have been buried or had treasure there in it, at least according to Heinrich Schliemann, uh, more or less. But it's kind of a debate about if it's the same time period of the Trojan War or not. I think some people think it might be older uh, than that. So it's kind of hard to say about that. Um, also, Schliemann uh, was famous for doing some excavations with the grave circles. That's one of the main things he did uh, at at Mycenae is uh, excavating those uh, graves. And the grave circles were um, burial sites of nobility. Uh, they were actually buried in um, what they call shaft graves that were dug down uh, in below the earth. And um, a lot of the um, nobility were actually buried with all their armor, their armor, uh, their their swords, their daggers. I think they found trinkets and cups uh, in it as well. Schleiman was very famous for finding what they call the Mask of Agamemnon in it, which was a gold death mask that was put on one of the My Mycenaean noblemen that he found buried uh, in one of these graves. And I've got a picture of it uh, right here. Uh, he thinks it was, an, I don't know if that's really true. He just kind of probably just called it that, but he thought maybe it could have been Agamemnon's, but nobody knows for sure uh, if it really was or not. So so anyway, those are some of the excavation sites uh, that he was, of course, known for uh, more or less. So yeah, Mycenae was one site he went to uh, and did excavations. Uh, and then, of course, like I said later, uh, Schleiman was also known for going to what they think was the ancient site of Troy, uh, which is in northwestern Turkey, and also doing archaeological digs uh, there as well. Now, also, I need to talk about also the Trojan War. I'll get, get more into it 
uh, what, what the Trojan War um, was about. Uh, now, whether the Trojan War happened or not, they don't know. So it's kind of like one of these debates uh, that they have today uh, or not. They think it was kind of like this mythological war, uh, which was involving the, the Greek gods uh, at the time. They think that the Trojan War happened maybe close to 1200 BC, although it's been debated about if it's the 13th or 12th century. So there's, they're not just kind of put 1200, but I don't know exactly know when it was, but 1250, I think BC might be a popular date sometime. It was considered a, a, the peak period of the Mycenaean culture. Um, it was a war between really two sides. You had, of course, the Mycenaean. Uh, states, cities, city-states uh, that were in Greece uh, that you had. Homer doesn't call them Mycenaean. He calls them Achaean, but Achaean's actually a later name that they call the Greek Helen peoples that come in during the Iron Age. And I don't know if it's the same people or not he's talking about, but uh, basically that's what he called the Mycenaeans, the Achaeans. And then on the other side, they had the Trojans, uh, which with their city or in city and city state of Troy, uh, which I told you was located in the northwestern part of Turkey, uh, south of the Black Sea, uh, where it's located. And uh, according to the story in Hom Homer's Iliad uh, about the Trojan War, the Trojan War broke out over a woman, uh, Helen of Troy, as they called her later. And Helen of Troy was actually the wife of the king of Sparta, King Menelaus. And evidently, uh, Tro a Trojan prince, Paris, who came to uh, visit, I think it was a diplomatic mission to uh, to Sparta, took her with him back to Troy as his wife. Of course, there's a debate about whether she went willingly or not. I think the Greeks thought that he stole her, you know, kidnapped her. And then, of course, the Trojans said, no, she, she wanted to go with him. Uh, and fell in love with him, I guess, and left. Uh, and so it became a big quarrel that the Greek gods supposedly uh, helped to start in all of this. And they say that the whole Trojan War started because the Greek gods were quarreling over which goddess was the fairest, like they're the prettiest, you know, of them all. Uh, and so uh, what happened was they decided to give this golden apple, often called the apple of discord, to Paris to decide which goddess was the prettiest. And he chose Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty. And so apparently what happened was Aphrodite made uh, Helen of Troy fall in love with Paris. And that's how they ended up together. Now, whether that's a true story, I don't know. It's probably just myth mythology or whatever. But uh, it evidently made King, King the king of Sparta, Menelaus, mad. And so he formed a kind of an alliance with the king of Mycenae, who was his brother, Agamemnon. And so they got together and basically declared war on the Trojans. Uh, and they got together forces, maybe a thousand ships or so, and they basically decided to cross the Aegean and try to attack the Trojans and defeat them, try to get hell of Troy back. Uh, and so that's pretty much, you know, what caused the war uh, to eventually break out uh, in all that. Now, of course, they say, what, what is it, the, the face that launched a thousand ships, you know, Helen of Troy. Um, now, Homer's Iliad does not cover the entire time of the conflict. They believe that the Trojan War lasted 10 years. Now, they're fighting that long because it was a siege. It was a siege war uh, where apparently the Greeks couldn't take Troy because it was so fortified. And so Homer really only goes into a short period really talking about the Trojan War, more to, more to the near end of it over a period, I want to say a few months. Uh, and and uh, that part where, you know, the, the the Troy gets, you know, sacked and that they use the Trojan horse, the Greeks, to defeat him is something that he doesn't really go into. It's not mentioned. Uh, and it's really something that the Romans later kind of talk about later, like in epics like the Aeneid, uh, which is written later by by the Roman poet Virgil, uh, but kind of go through and talk about some of the major characters that were in uh, the Iliad with the Trojan War. On the Greek side, those were pretty much, I guess, would be the main characters. Uh, they were the most famous. 
uh, in the Iliad story of the Trojan War. Agamemnon, I told you, was the king of, of Mycenae. He's the one that pretty much led the forces uh, to attack Troy in Turkey. Menelaus was his brother, of course, the king of Sparta. He's the one his wife got, you know, taken, uh, Helen. Achilles, of course, is the most famous character in the whole Iliad. Uh, of course, he is the famous um, major, you know, big hero uh, of the Greeks. When he's fighting, they're un unbeatable. And uh, Achilles was believed to be part God, uh, invincible, except whereas Achilles, he was. Uh, Odysseus was another character later, of course, important as well. Odysseus, you know, was the king of Ithaca. Uh, and he was, of course, the one that supposedly came up with the idea of the Trojan horse uh, to defeat Troy. Uh, and then Odysseus was also one of the main characters in the Odyssey story uh, that Homer may have told uh, as well as he tries to get back home, of course, to Ithaca. Uh, those were the main Trojan characters that were famous. King Priam was the king of the Trojans. He had two sons, which were Hector and Paris. Hector was the oldest son. Hector, of course, was the best warrior and hero on the Trojan side. And then Paris was his younger brother, uh, the one that kind of helped start the war when he took Paris. Uh, of course, what is the peak story, the most famous story, of course, in the Trojan War, dealing with the Iliad told by Homer? Uh, of course, that's obviously the story of Achilles and Hector. Those two eventually would battle it out, you know, uh, during the Trojan War, single combat. Uh, and of course, as you know, uh, Achilles would kill Hector. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, considered the most famous story. And um, I think later Achilles died too in the at the end of the war uh, as well. And at one point there was actually a tomb there of Achilles uh, that existed uh, at the ancient site of Troy uh, that people would visit like Alexander the Great and even some Roman emperors, I think, visited it. So it's interesting that the, there was actually a tomb there. I'm not sure if why, how it got there or whatever, or if he, when he was even a real guy. So it's hard to say if these are real people or not, more or less. Uh, like I said, this is mostly from like later accounts by the Romans and other people, but they think the Trojans were tricked you know, into losing using the Trojan horse idea. And this was an idea they think, like I said, of King Odysseus to um, basically act like they had given up on the war and had gone home. And so they gave him this Trojan horse as an offering to their gods. Uh, but of course they didn't know that the Greeks had put men inside, like soldiers inside of it, uh, with King Odysseus leading them. And so when they uh, brought it into their city, they just opened the gates and the Greeks were able to sack you know, the, the, the city of Troy from the inside, inside out. So it's kind of like, kind of like the, you know, Trojan horse virus you may have heard about, kind of like the same thing. Well, there's no archaeological evidence to back it up you know, that there ever was a Trojan, Trojan horse, but it's just something that that's later, later written about. Uh, like I said about Schliemann, Schliemann may have, uh, they think, found possibly the site of um, of Troy, uh, I don't know. They, it's kind of still debated about whether it is. But in north, like I said, northwestern Turkey, uh, they think there's a site there uh, that's called Hisarlik, is the name of it, uh, which is a Turkish name that means in Turkish place of fortifications. Uh, and evidently, it was some kind of ancient site that went back to the time of the Hittites. Uh, that may have been used there. So it's kind of in a very important area because it's kind of going between the Black Sea, Black Sea and the Aegean. So it could be this whole thing that this Trojan War may have been fought over, um, over actually trade, you know, trade going in from east to west or whatever. And um, apparently Schliemann went there uh, in the 1870s and be began doing excavations there. He's actually talked into going there by this American archaeologist named Frank, Frank Calvert was his name. And uh, anyway, he found like what is like close to maybe they think nine cities that were buried on top of each other. Uh, they think Troy 7 or Troy 7A, something like that, they think might be the ancient site of Troy. Uh, and uh, there evidently there was a case where Schliemann 
1873, found some treasure that was buried uh, in the inside of a wall uh, at, at this ancient site, Hisarlik in northwestern Turkey. And he called it Priam's treasure. Um, and um, historians today are not sure whether it's really evidence of Troy or not in the Trojan War. So I think later they did some dating on it or something like that. And it proved not to be really the same time period of maybe when the Trojan War was. Although who knows when the Trojan War was. Maybe it happened earlier, the Trojan War. You know, maybe it wasn't in the 13th or 12th century. Maybe it was in the 14th or 15th century. It's kind of a debate about that when it was. And um, all that you're looking at there, and, the, and the, of course in the picture on the right and the left, all that's actually gold, gold, gold artifacts. Uh, they were all found uh, by Schliemann. Uh, and uh, that's his wife there, of course, with some of it on. Um, his actual wife was named Helen. I think her name was Sophia. Uh, she changed her name to Helen because he was so big into the Iliad story. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, um, that was the like the last hurrah, they think, of the whole, you know, um, Trojan period. Yeah, the Mycenaean culture would, would decline. Uh, it would, of course, collapse in what is the late Bronze Age period, uh, which happens around maybe close to about 1200 BC. And of course, I'm going to get into it in a little bit, uh, but Iron Age peoples are going to come in and they're going to basically conquer the Aegean region. They're going to take over. That's going to lead into the so-called Greek Age or Hellenic Age uh, that's going to follow. So let me go ahead and review a little bit uh, for what I've covered so far today, of course, on ancient Greece. Uh, dealing with the Bronze Age. Uh, it says around what seed did mostly ancient Greece develop as one of the first European civilizations? Uh, that would be, of course, the uh, Aegean Sea. What mythological figure is Europe named after? Uh, Europa, who was a Phoenician princess in Greek mythology. What is the historical name for early Greek history when the Minoans and Mycenaeans flourished? Uh, that would be called the Greek Bronze Age or also called the Aegean Civilization. Uh, who were the Minoans? Uh, the Minoans were a uh, Aegean civilization, one of the first European cultures uh, that developed on the island of Crete uh, and also in the Cyclades uh, throughout the Aegean. Uh, they were known for their maritime power, their maritime trade. What, island, what main island did they develop in the southern Aegean basin? I just said, of course, the island of Crete uh, as well. Uh, who was the archaeologist that discovered the Minoans? That would be Arthur Evans, who went there to the island in the late 1800s. What palace and really a city complex did he excavate in the early 1900s? That would be Canossus. Who is the mythological king associated with the Minoans? King Minos, because that's who uh, Sir Arthur Evans named him after. What famous legend is associated with this king? Uh, king uh, the, the Minotaur, uh, the story of the bull monster that may have been associated with King Minos. What was the main Minoan language discovered by author Evans? It's called Linear A. What type of artwork were the Minoans famous for in their palaces and homes? All fresco paintings. What caused the Minoans to decline? They believe the Minoan culture was caused by some kind of cataclysmic natural catastrophe, which was like a volcanic eruption. They often call it the Thera eruption, which happened close to 1600 BC, where Santorini is. What myth or legend is possibly associated with their decline? Uh, some historians think that the Minoan, Minoans being wiped out is very similar to the Atlantis story told by Plato. Uh, who are the Mycenaeans? Where are they develop in Greece? Uh, the Mycenaeans was another Bronze Age culture that developed on the Greek mainland. Uh, they mostly developed in like southern Greece, especially around the Peloponnese. What main language did they adopt that was similar to the Minoan writing? Uh, they had what they call Linear B, uh, which is a early pre-Greek language. What type of cities were they famous for building? Which one was the most famous? Uh, the Mycenaeans were known for building fortified cities that were constructed on hilltops. Some were almost like a citadel. Uh, which one was the most famous? Uh, the ci city of Mycenae, which is up in the northeastern part of the Peloponnese Peninsula. Uh, who was the German archaeologist who discovered and excavated sites like Mycenae, 
also ancient site of Troy, that is Sarlik. That would be, of course, Heinrich Schliemann. What was the Lion Gate? The Lion Gate is the, the, one of the two main entrances at the um, city of Mycenae. It's the most famous architectural feature out there, besides all the construction. Uh, that's also part of the actual fortification. What types of tombs were discovered by Schliemann or graves? Uh, he found the uh, Tholos tomb. Well, he, he excavated the Tholos tomb area, uh, which were these honey, honey, um, these beehive-shaped tombs uh, of the Mycenaeans. They also found the grave circles. He did a lot of excavation with that, uh, into like the graves of the grave circles of the uh, Mycenaean nobility. You know where he found the um, mask of Agamemnon, etc. What epic poems were, uh, were the Greek poet Homer famous for writing? Uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which the Iliad is, of course, the most famous about the Trojan War. What was the Trojan War? Uh, the Trojan War was a famous uh, mythological war. It may have been real. Uh, that was fought between the Greek Greeks, like the Mycenaean cultures, and the uh, Trojans in Turkey, uh, which was based around Troy. Uh, happened maybe 12th, 13th century, but it's debated. What was the main cause, according to Homer? Why did it break out? Uh, because of uh, Helen of Troy being taken by Paris. Uh, who are the major characters in the Iliad? I told you um, Agamemnon, king of Mycenae. He was one that led the uh, Greeks. He had his brother Menelaus of Sparta, who was also involved. I told you about Achilles. Achilles was the main most famous hero uh, in the Iliad, who was the greatest Greek warrior and hero. And then you also, I told you about uh, Odysseus, the king of Ithaca, the one that was in the Odyssey story. He's also the one that came up with the Trojan horse story, uh, uh, idea anyway. Uh, then the Trojans had King Priam. Priam was the king of the Trojans. Uh, also, uh, you had um, uh, Hector. Hector was the oldest son of Priam. He was their best hero and warrior. And then you had the younger brother of Hector, which was Paris. Uh, what Turkish site did Schliemann possibly discover uh, what is ancient Troy? It's called his Sarlik, which is up in the north, north, northwestern part of Turkey. It might be the site of ancient Troy. All right, so I'm going to move on. I'm going to next course talk about, we've got a few minutes. I'm going to go ahead and go into the period of the uh, Greek city states. Uh, of course, we're going to, and I'm going to first talk about uh, a period uh, in Greek history. Uh, I told you how the Trojans, the, uh, the Trojan War, after the Trojan War, the Mycenaean culture collapsed like overnight. There's a case where a lot of different cultures in the Mediterranean Sea collapsed, the so-called Late Bronze Age collapse when Iron Age peoples came into the region. So that happens around the same period as the Sea Peoples invading, which might be somehow connected uh, to these peoples. And uh, what happened was um, they have a period that comes in after the Mycenaean period that's called the Greek Dark Age. Uh, it happens about maybe around the 12th century and goes down to about the ninth century, over a period of about three centuries. And um, Greek peoples basically came in, and they took over Greece. Uh, they were called the Hellens, is what they called them. And uh, the Hellens were uh, basically what they call now the Greeks. Uh, and um, they think they came in, even though they had like iron weapons and all that, evidently it caused some kind of decline in culture, more or less. And so during that period, there's a lack of information about the Greek Dark Age. Uh, mostly it comes from a combination of archaeology uh, and what Homer said. Because Homer's living, they say, uh, in kind of the part of that period, like probably the end of it. I want to say like, I guess around the 10th century maybe is when Homer's living. And so Homer's kind of writing about that period. Um, now the Hellens, the Hellens were basically, uh, they think where the name comes from is that it, they think they were descended from this ancient Greek person that was called Helen, H-E-L-L-E-N-E. -E. Uh, and he was either some kind of chieftain or early king of some type. 
And uh, evidently he had a lot of children and grand and yeah, children like sons and grandsons that, that were kind of he had it later. And uh, all of his uh, relatives later is his, his descendants are basically where the Greek tribes developed. And so you get the Ionians, the Dorians, the Aeolians. I think those are the three main tribes. Oh, they were well known. You also got the Achaeans. That might be where Homer came up with the idea of Achaean, because the Achaeans was one of the, the, the Greek tribes. Uh, they were made up of the so-called Hellens. So, so that's where you get the term Helen from. And the word Helen today is, by the way, a word meaning someone who's a Greek uh, still today. Uh, and so they use the term Hellenic. They're talking about all the Greeks. Uh, so Hellenic age would mean Greek age, uh, basically the age of the Greeks, uh, more or less. Now, during this time, uh, there's, of course, you have the rise of the Greek city-states uh, that come in, which a Greek city-state is called a polis or poli. That would be the plural form of it, uh, basically. And uh, the Greeks didn't really have, like, major kingdoms. Uh, they each lived, like, with a, a state with a major city uh, that was part of it. And the Greeks had numerous of these. They had like, I don't know, I forget how many. They probably had several hundred uh, at one point that they had. They were all independent of each other uh, throughout the Aegean Basin. And um, the period of the Greek Age goes from about 776 to 323 B.C. It starts around the time of the Olympics. And it goes all the way down to the time of when Alexander the Great died. So it's about a period of roughly four or five hundred years uh, that the Greeks were dominant uh, throughout the Aegean Sea this way politically. Uh, you can see that the Greek Age or Hellenic Age is divided into two sub-periods, uh, the Archaic Greece, and then they have what they call Classical Greece. Uh, I'll give you a, a slide here to show you the different uh, sub-periods of how they're divided up. Archaic Greece basically means Old Greece, that's what it means. Old Greece would go back to the 8th century and then go down to like the about 500 BC. Uh, it's believed to have started, they believe, when the Olympic Games got started in ancient Greece a long time ago. Uh, Olympic Games traditionally started about 776 BC. Well, that's debated. And then it goes down about 500 when the uh, Persian Wars broke out between the Greeks and the Persian Empire. Uh, the classical Greece goes from about the Persian Wars, when the Greeks are fighting the Persian Empire, and it goes all the way down to the death of Alexander the Great, who died in 323 BC. So, and why do they call it classical Greece? It's called that because that's like the peak period, you know, of Greek culture, uh, where that's when they have basically, um, you know, the best, you know, all the famous people in Greece. Plato and Aristotle, you know, Socrates, uh, Herodotus, Diogenes, um, Sophocles, all the famous Greek people uh, that you know of and read about or heard about before, uh, all lived uh, basically uh, in the in the so-called classical classical period. Um Oh, they do have this other period later. I'm not going to talk about it now. When I get to Alexander the Great and all that and the Macedonians, they have the so-called Hellenistic Age uh, that goes from about 323 to 30 or 31 BC. It lasts almost 300 years. And that's when uh, Alexander the Great conquered the Persian Empire and spread Greek culture to the Near East. Now, Greek city-states uh, are um, they're everywhere. So you can see them throughout the Aegean from the Greek mainland uh, they're in Western Turkey. They're in Thrace up here. All the different islands, of course, had also different, you know, um, Greeks living there. So they were they were basically everywhere, uh, more or less. Uh, let me quickly talk about a few things about the Greek city-state. The most Greek city-states had what they call a high point, like I said, or a hill that they built their cities on. Uh, like Athens had the famous Acropolis. Uh, that you see behind me and those pictures I've showed you before. You've probably seen that before with the picture behind me. Uh, and um, anyway, um, but basically it was a civic center. Uh, and um, the 
most of the Greeks would use it as like temples. They built a lot of their temples there. Like uh, on the Acropolis, they built like the Parthenon, which is, of course, the most famous temple uh, that's there. It's built there. Uh, but the uh, Greeks also used the Acropolis for like military defense. Like in case they got attacked by another state, uh, they would basically use it to hold out against an enemy. And so that's primarily uh, what they use it for. At Athens, the actual Acropolis of Athens is about 400 something feet above the rest of the city. So it towers over the rest of the city, uh, more or less. Like I said, that's where they built a lot of their famous temples there, like the Parthenon and the Temple of Athena, Nike, etc., uh, that was built later in the 400s BC or 5th century BC. Uh, the Greeks also have what they call an agora. Yeah, an agora. Uh, an agora is like, a, or agora, they say it that way too. It was like a town square, kind of like a Roman forum. Uh, and it's where basically all the citizens would meet uh, for different um, important features with the state. And uh, it could be like where they have all their assemblies, uh, which they called a council, marketplaces where they could sell and buy goods, theaters where they put on entertainment, uh, baths, uh, put on public games, uh, and so on. So the Agora... Really, the Agora and the, and the Acropolis kind of, you know, is kind of where the Romans get their forum from, which is more like a plaza, I think, more than anything. But that's basically what it was. The word Agora, Agora, meant either assembly place or gathering place or gathering area is what it meant. Also, real quick, um, the Greek city-states uh, also had different types of government, which you can see those are the four that they preferred democracy, oligarchy, tyranny, and, of course, monarchy, which was more rare, more or less. Of course, democracy was the most important thing that the Greeks were known for. Um, it's something that the Athenians developed in the 6th and 5th centuries at Athens, and uh, the direct democracy was where all male citizens would directly participate uh, in like either like assemblies that they had, which was called a consul, we're also called a boule, B-O-U-L-E. Uh, and um, then also they could vote uh, as well. And if you were chosen you know, for a certain position, like say the Council of 400, Council of 500, et cetera, which would be later, um, they would usually choose, you, choose your name by lot. Uh, but only all the male citizens could participate. Women didn't really have any equal rights to men or anything like that. Uh, the word democratia, you see in Greek, which is where you get the word democracy from, actually means, well, now it means ruled by the people, but originally it meant ruled by the tribes because the Greeks divide themselves up into to a tribe, which is called a demi, D-E-M-E. -E. Uh, they also have what they call an oligarchy uh, as well. Oligarchy was a type of uh, government which was mostly controlled by an elite, upper class, like either nobility or aristocrats, uh, basically. Nobody else had any power of course, but except them. And you can see that the word oligarchy meant in Greek ruled by a few. So only a few people can really have any real power. Everybody else doesn't really have any power at all. Uh, Sparta, of course, became one of the most famous states, of course, to have an oligarchy uh, that's well known. Um, and um, it was one of the reasons why Sparta and Athens didn't really like each other because politically, they were different. It was almost like the U.S. versus the Soviet Union or something <laughs> back in those days. I uh, also had what they call it, tyranny or tyranny. Uh, that was like another kind of Greek form of government that was also popular. Like uh, Athens at one, one point experimented with this. And a, a tyrant was a type of aristocratic type ruler uh, that ruled usually without a constitution. Uh, and he usually had help from the lower classes. He was very popular with them because he would do a lot of good things for them, uh, more or less. And so, yeah, for a while, the, some of the Greek states borrowed that idea. And they believed that the uh, tyrant was something that influenced the Romans later because the Romans took it and developed the Roman dictatorship. Uh, you may have heard of Julius Caesar, who was an example of a Roman dictator. They also think that the Roman dictator led to the Roman emperor over time. So it kind of evolved from something that was a Greek thing a long time ago. They had monarchies too, but like I said, they were rare. Uh, very few states actually 
you know, had monarchs. Sparta was, you know, one of the exceptions uh, where they had two hereditary kings. Uh, but like I said, it was an elite government where like it was an oligarchy where the Spartans, only the Spartans had really any power, you know, in the actual state. Uh, so if you're a foreigner, uh, if you were like the Helots that were like, you know, slaves or serfs, you didn't really have any power except the Spartans. Uh, and so that's pretty much the kinds of governments that they had, of course, uh, in Greece, in ancient Greece. Now, later I am going to, of course, be talking about, um, of course, more about Greece. I think that's going to be it lecture-wise, of course, for uh, talking about ancient Greece. Uh, and um, next time I'll kind of continue talking about the Greek city-states. I'm going to talk about, you know, the Greek militia. I'll talk about uh, the differences between uh, Sparta and Athens, how, how they were big rivals uh, and, and the differences between the two states. I'll get into the Greco-Persian Wars as well in the aftermath of those wars uh, that follow. If I have any time next week, probably part of Monday and Wednesday, I'll also get into Greek culture. So this is going to be a, probably a three or four part series of lectures I'll have this week and next week, which um, I'm going to probably cover uh, ancient Greece and then, of course, get into the Macedonian period of the Hellenistic Age. So all these lectures of this one and probably the three next week will probably be part of the second exam coming up. Uh, and I've already given you the notes on China, uh, which will go, of course, into that exam. But mostly my lectures are going to be on Greece, which will go towards that, that exam. Now, before I go, uh, don't forget that um, you've got a bunch of assignments that are still due. Uh, you got the Mesopotamia quiz. Uh, you got the Egypt video quiz. I still got it. It's still open. You got it forever. Uh, you got so much time to do it. I don't know how you don't get it done, uh, some of you. But um, And then, of course, you got the first exam. That's the main thing you need to be working on right now. Uh, to get that done by next week. Uh, like I said, if you haven't turned your first vocab in, email that to me uh, so I can add it in uh, so you can get points for it, all that. So I'm going to put this, of course, lecture up on my YouTube channel, of course, afterwards. And if anybody, of course, um, has a question or not about this video, let me know um, and get back with me. If you got an administrative question, just email me, uh, et cetera. So that's it. Hope you all have a good weekend and you all take care.